Is it is Summon Sork Pass? No. <sighs> uh, scapegoat Double Misses Radiant. No. <sighs> Firewall. Right, he's banned. I, I can't get it. I can't memorize a single combo line. Joseph, you're the dumbest man I've ever met. But there's still a deck you can play. Thank you. You still need me to read it. Yeah, if, if you wouldn't. Hey everybody, Joseph Rothschild here, aka MBT, back again with another episode of 10 Minute Testing. You know, a lot of decks these days require just a little bit too much brain power, which can leave players of my acuity without anything relevant to pilot. Happily, a new card release may have imbued playability upon the dumbest deck since Trickstar, presenting Gren Maju 2019. So here's the list, and hmm. You know, last time we played this, there was a fair amount of unplayable garbage inside designed to enable Gren Maju to Iza, and that's notably absent here. As always, I'll give you a background about the archetype, a little bit of a discussion about what I hope the deck can do, and of course, the card by card. So firstly, for those of you that don't know, Gren Maju has been a gimmicky one-note deck that's graced the tables of 500, or if you're lucky, 499, since the printing of Pot of Desires. Its hallmark card, Gren Maju de Iza, gains 400 attack for every banished card you control, which, provided you're building around it, could easily enable a 10k beater, or better, for the low, low cost of one normal summon. The bad news is that in the past, building around it left you with a dorky deck full of garbage. Pots of Duality cut most special summony generic good stuff from your grasp. Gold Sarcophagi devoted to multiple Necroface meant you were playing at least five cards that did almost literally nothing. And a lack of playables meant you were sheepishly cycling through Swift Scarecrows and Battle Fader, the hallmarks of decks doing remarkably little. Until now, the release of Metal Snake Orochimaru has opened up an exciting new possibility in the world of Gren Maju, the ability to play good cards. Metal Snake Maramu no Orochi, and I know I'm butchering that, can be special summoned as a quick effect by banishing the top eight cards of your deck, then can destroy a monster on the field for an additional three. This coupled with the limiting of Golden Sarcophagus finally unshackling us from that semi-limited stinker Necroface, and the release of another extremely playable Banish Boy, Pot of Extravagance, means this train wreck has transformed from try-or-die trash to a titillating tempo deck. Since we no longer rely on drawing the Gren Maju or experiencing a painful death, we've filled the empty slots usually reserved for Battle Fader and Swift Scarecrow with good stuff options like Panker Tops and Hand Traps, and the now absent Enabler spells with the Kaiju Suite, Board Wipes, and cards like Super Poly designed to simplify game states. If we are able to reduce meta strategies to a comparison of individual card quality, we'll end up on top every time. So with that, let's get into the card by card. Firstly, we've got 3 Metal Snake Orochi, which is another fantastic cybernetic dragon from the geniuses at Konami behind every single boss monster released since 2014. While we're doing enablers, we're playing 3 copies of Eater of Millions, followed by 3 Dino Wrestler Pankratops, who is simply too good to forego. After that are our Kaiju, 2 Gamciel and 2 Kumungus, followed by our Hand Traps, 3 Phantasmase, who's really just better duality, 3 Ash Blossom, and 3 Effect Veiler, infip for the cultured Thanos dragon player. Finally, we're on three copies of some big dumb red idiot. For the spells, we're on three desires, three extravagance, three kaiju slumber, one super polymerization, one raigeki, and one foolish burial, since the metal snack can be special summoned from the graveyard. For traps, we're on evenly matched, since we aim to blind second. The extra deck is an extravagance board, since it's unlikely we'll end up with three Link materials, we're only on Nightmares, Phoenix, and Cerberus, followed by our Super Poly targets, Mud Dragon, Violet Chimera, and Starving Venom. So with that, let's jump into the games. Our first match is up against Prank Kids. Prank Kids at one point were poised to take over the metagame, until they revealed that their YCS domination had been, unfortunately for their pilots, just a prank. We're going second, which is optimal. We have both an evenly matched and a hand trap, albeit Effect Veiler isn't particularly effective in this matchup. Our opponent's going to lead with the Pot of Desires before activating Prank Kids Prank for a token, then normal summoning a copy of Fancies. They'll go into Doodle, we'll activate Effect Veiler in response, happy to find a target for this card at any point in this matchup. They'll get a copy of Roxies from deck before Link summoning Bow Wow Wow, triggering the effect of Roxies for a copy of Lamps 
Fancies, activating Terraforming, activating Prank Kid's House to get a copy of Fancies to hand, setting one card, and activating Prank Kid's Prank It and Step. For turn we draw... Okay, an Ash Blossom, on time as always. We'll start with a Pot of Extravagance. We find two Effect Veiler, are you kidding me? Our opponent will activate the effect of Bow Wow Wow, tagging out to add two of their Prank Kids cards back to hand and keeping their Fusion spell. We'll pass back to our opponent because I am convinced we're not dead here. They draw Instant Fusion for turn and it looks like I'm gonna have to remain convinced. Our opponent chains in such a way that we are not only able to activate Ash Blossom, but also able to affect Veiler, which is fantastic news for us. Less fantastic news is they now have the materials to make Boral Sword after tagging out with this copy of Prank Kid's Rocket. They will do just that. We'll activate Effect Veiler, I think, to trick our opponent into thinking we're not dead. And thankfully, 6,000 damage is not 8,000, and we live to fight another day. We do have a removal spell in hand, which should do the trick. We'll lead with it, giving our opponent a copy of Gamsiel and ourselves a copy of Kumungus before activating Pot of Desires to make a Honk chunker of a Grenma Judaiza. It's not exactly lethal, but because Prank Kids needs about two cards to get going, I feel confident we're not dead, and our opponent concedes. Prank Kid is the perfect litmus test for this type of strategy, since it's the exact form of deck you're likely to find around the low-tier tables you end up at. Our second match is up against a deck that does not yet exist, Orcist. I'm not referring to the Virgin TCG Orcist. I mean the Chad OCG Orcist with Dingirsu and that tribal judgment that everyone seems to get nowadays. Our opponent's going to start with a copy of Neo Space Connector, getting themselves a copy of Aqua Dolphin from deck and ripping our poor defenseless Ash Blossom from our hand. Afterwards, they'll go into a Nightmare. We will activate Phantasmase. They'll go into Mermaid, use Mermaid's effect to get Orchestrated Nightmare, and what do we draw off that Mothman but a second copy of Ash Blossom? They're going to go into a Hornet Bit and then Link Summon this copy of Brandish Maiden Kagari, adding it back. They'll use Orchestrated Nightmare's effect and Harpoor's effect to get a copy of Scared Zone before going to Summon Sorceress, and would you look at that, that Ash Blossom makes quick work of any potential as a thought board. Afterwards, they'll bring back Galatee and shuffle back this copy of Harp Horror to get themselves a copy of Babel, go into Topologic, go into Dingirsu, trigger the effect of Topologic, destroy our entire board but not theirs, set two cards and pass it back. Things are looking bad, but not unwinnable. We're going to start by activating the effect of this interrupted Kaiju Slumber and giving our opponent a Kaiju in his own that will destroy it. Afterwards, we'll activate this copy of... Pot of Desires will activate Phantasmase's effect again, once again in a zone pointed to by this copy of Topologic Bomber Dragon so we can clear our opponent's board, the counter trap is unusable, and we are able to fire our evenly matched. From this position, we just have to survive one additional turn, which is not too difficult to do, and we are suddenly in this game. We draw a Regeki, we'll lead with a Pot of Desires, then fire said Regeki before normal summoning an 8400 attack Grand Maju and winning the game. Alright, I'm feeling cocky. Let's keep the singles coming. Our third match is up against Salaman Great. More like Salaman ill-equipped to deal with an 8400 attack normal summoned monster. Our opponent's going to start by, well, going through the motions, using the effect of Foxy to find, oh, whatever they need at any given time. This time, it's a second copy of Spinny. They're then going to go into a copy of Veilinx. We're going to activate the effect of Phantasm Dragon Phasmase. They're going to activate the effect of Gazelle. We'll draw a couple of cards and, ooh, is that an evenly matched? They'll then activate the effect of Gazelle. We'll activate the effect of Ash Blossom, and they will reveal that they have a copy of Called By in the hand. That's upsetting, but not the end of the world. They'll activate Spinny's effect, sending a roar to Graveyard as well, before going to Mirage Stallio for a Falco. They're then going to go into a copy of Sunlight Wolf, trigger the effect of Mirage Stallio. Ooh, that Phantasmase is coming back. You better believe it. We're then going to set this copy of Roar and pass it back. We draw a Regeki, which is interesting. We'll lead with the Pot of Indulgence. They don't bite. We'll then activate Super Polymerization to get a Violet Chimera. We'll get ourselves a copy of a Snake, and while we don't have a copy of our good old boy Gren Maju, we do have enough to deal a significant amount of damage to our opponent's life points. We could have been a little greedier and gone for this copy of Pankratops for Lethal, but I didn't feel that it was relevant. Our opponent's going to activate the effect of a second copy of Gazelle in hand will activate Phantasmase, and of course, it is Roared. Our opponent's then going to bring back Jack Jaguar before going to update Jammer, and oh god, oh no, there's a Jammered Boralode. They will first steal back a copy of Violet Chimera, then decrease the attack of the snake so Violet Chimera's effect procs and deal 3,000 points of damage to us. We'll activate Evenly Matched, and thank god we're still alive. We'll use Snack's effect once again before activating Pot of Desires, and what do we find but, oh, thank god, enough. We'll activate the effect of Nightmare Cerberus to destroy the kaiju we just gave our opponent, and attack for lethal. Bring on the gods of the format! If I'm able to assemble Nightmare Cerberus lethal against Salaman Great, I should have no problem dispatching with a puny striker pilot. We are going second, as always. Our opponent is going to activate Multi-Roll, followed by a copy of Startup Engage for a 
Area Zero. I intend to use this copy of Ash Blossom to prevent the ray from hitting the field, but they find a copy of Engage off of said Area Zero, and we'll just decide to Ash the Shizuku at end step. We'll go for Phantasmase as they go into Hayate. They'll add a copy of Widow Anchor with a copy of Engage, and the Engage back with a copy of Kagari, adding a copy of Shark Cannon, setting for triggering the effect of Multi-Roll and activating the effect of Shizuku. Things aren't over. We draw for turn, and what do we find but a Pankratops? We'll start with a copy of Pot of Extravagance. We'll draw a couple of cards. They'll chain a shared ride, which, of course, does not draw them any. We'll activate IKS and, oh, accidentally give them the better kaiju. Oh, what a silly mistake. I hope you enjoy being five for one. We'll pass it back to our opponent, who elected to keep a Widow Anchor. We'll activate this copy of Foolish Burial Goods to draw a card off of Metal Foes Fusion, set two, and pass it back. Things are looking exceptionally good. We're going to activate the Grave Effect of IKS before firing off a Pot of Desires. Ooh, there's a Gren Maju. We'll go ahead and bid a copy of the Sneck to get it out before normal summoning a Gren Maju. We go to Battle Phase, and I do elect to beat over my own Gren and Maju, uh, just because getting in chip damage is pretty relevant with an Eater of Millions in our hand. Our opponent's going to start by setting a copy of Called By and passing back. We draw a Grand Maju, we will assemble Eater Lethal, then normal summon a Grand Maju, forcing them to expend their remaining Widow Anchor on said Grand Maju, getting in for 24, 50, and 39. All right, all right, enough screwing around. Our fifth game is our best of three versus meta. Our opponent is playing Thunder Dragon, and what's interesting about their variant of Thunder Dragon is that while it includes the Gar Dragon combos that have made the deck so potent in recent months, it's by and large an old school Thundies deck. This is exceptionally bad for us. While we excel at board breaking, things like Regeki and Evenly Matched ensure that we're able to chew through multiple pieces of negation, we're not very good at beating over individual Colossuses. Let's see if we can do it here. Our opponent's going to start by activating Allure of Darkness. They'll banish a copy of Roar to get a copy of Origin from deck. That's a card I haven't seen in a while. They'll activate the effect of Hawk for a second monster on their side of the board to go to Katamari Summer Vacation. Normal summon an Origin and end on a Colossus. Our hand, for the first time tonight, doesn't do a lot. Our opponent's going to go into a Thunder Dragon Titan before triggering Bolt. They'll get Avian to get back Roar to go into a second copy of Super Bolt. That triggers the effect of Diabolos in hand. This is upsetting. It's certainly an OTK, but of course the Snake can be activated from hand. We'll do it right now. We get to eat this copy of Thunder Dragon Titan. We take 3,000 and 1,600. Notably, we're not dead and we are able to activate evenly matched, but we still can't deal with the Colossus. We'll start by activating this copy of Pot of Extravagance, but our opponent has an Ash Blossom at the ready and things aren't looking so hot. We'll activate Snack and then normal summon a Grand Maju, hoping to get in for like 4,000, but they have a Veiler for that as well. They draw for turn. It's an Eon Thunder Dragon. They'll go into a Titan, trigger the effect of Bolt, go into Eon, activate Avian and Roar, and we'll concede. So it's time for game two, and Jesus, our opponent must have boarded in a lot of hand traps. DD Crow is making an appearance. I'll be excited to see Electric Virus out of the tank. Our grip isn't particularly exciting. We have two copies of the Snack, which is never what I want to see. These OPTs are H, and Dino Wrestler Pankratops does next to nothing in this matchup. Let's hope we can persevere. Our opponent will start by normal summoning a copy of Battery Man Solar, sending a copy of Roar, and then activating Hawk to get it back. They'll go into a Katamari Summer Vacation, triggering the effect of Roar. We'll activate Ash Blossom in response, forcing them onto a board of double Superbolt. It's not exciting, but it is game winning. We'll use Snack at end step because I'm operating under the delusion that, I don't know, I'll activate the other effect. We special summon a copy of Pankratops, which I recognize is actively bad, but I'm kind of floundering for a play right now. We're going to activate Pankratops on one of these copies of Super Bolt, getting them a Hawk. They're going to permit us to activate evenly matched, but as long as they keep a Bolt, there's nothing we can do. We draw for turn and... Oh, Now that's interesting. I don't feel as if I have to set it just yet. They're going to go into Lord, trigger the effect of Bolt, we'll activate Ash in response, which might be a bad idea because it prevents them from getting something we could potentially super poly. We get an Eater of Millions, and suddenly the pressure is off me to super polymerization. They have an effect failure, but that doesn't really solve the problem. They'll DD Crow our Snack in response to its activation, and suddenly we have exactly four turns to turn this around. They activate the effect of Keeper of Dragonic Magic. That is a spicy tech, but unfortunately we don't have have a relevant uh, card to activate Super Polyon. We'll banish this copy of Thunder Dragon Titan, and our opponent switches their monster to defense position. We'll banish it face down. I know one of these last two cards is Grand Maju, which is why I'm staying in the game. Finally, with White Dragon, Wyver Buster, and Titan, they give me the opportunity to activate Super Polymerization. We'll go into a Mud Dragon to the Swamp, and what do we rip off the top? But Grand Maju de Iza will banish this card face down, taking zero chances, and get in for, holy hell, 16,000 damage. All right, so time for that all-important game three. Our opener is not particularly exciting. Our opponent's is worse, but effective. They'll start by activating Allure of Darkness, and please just discard the entire hand. Get me out of this game. 
Ugh, they find a DD Crow. They'll Matrix into Matrix into Supervolt. It's not effective, but it is good enough. We're going to start with a copy of Pot of Extravagance. We draw well and evenly matched. That's something. We'll discard this Regeki because it does next to nothing. They'll Normal Summon a Battering Man Solar, and I'm not making the same mistake again. We're going to Ash Blossom on activation. They switch their monsters to attack position, I guess for intimidation factor, and then permit us to evenly match to the board. Now we're playing a little fast and loose with our life total here. We're going to take 2,600 points of damage. They'll pass it back. I figure, eh, I've got three turns. Let's see if I can draw out of this. We aren't yet, so we're going to give them another opportunity. They draw a copy of Ash Blossom. They get in for 2,600 points direct once again. For turn, we draw, well, a Pot of Desires. We'll fire that off, but unfortunately, they have the Ash Blossom at the ready. That's upsetting news for us. We'll pass it back to our opponent, who draws for turn a Battery Man Solar, but refuses to commit it to the board. We'll take 2,600, and things are getting desperate. We can't activate this copy of Pot of Desires because I have another plan in mind. It involves, when they go to battle phase, activating the effect of Snake to Special Summon it to our side of the board, then the horror using our own material to super polymerization. We go into Starving Venom Fusion Dragon, a monster that's actually powerful, and we draw for turn a Gren Maju. This is lethal until we see the effect failure. Well, regardless, I'm not worried. We have them on the ropes, and nothing they can summon has enough attack points to beat over our fleet. Until they activate Allure of Darkness, tribute for a Gamciel, and get in for 200 over lethal with a Pancratops they ripped off of Allure! So, we're back with the deck, and... Oh, color me impressed. If we played a little less greedily with our life total game 3, we probably could have walked away with it. Let's do the pros and cons. First, the pros. One, is pretty reasonable. I mean, every one of its individual pieces is good at simplifying the game state, and routinely you'll win just because Metal Snake Orochi is a recurrable threat and you can make one-for-ones. Grenmaju isn't as mission-critical as he used to be. Two, it lines up exceptionally well against the current metagame. The Kaiju package has kind of never been better. It deals with almost every problem card that would otherwise trip the archetype up, shutting off Striker spells, Salaman Great Roar, and whatever flavor of Negator Thunder decides to end on. Evenly puts in massive work, and you don't miss Battle Fader because no one OTKs anymore. Grenmaju itself even resists almost every type of monster removal in the format. And three, god it's a blast. I mean, even in the year of our Lord 2019, attacking directly for 16,000 feels just as good as it did when we were playing sleepy necroface setups. And the cons. One, okay, so there's this one exceptionally weird problem I did not expect to face. You can very easily accidentally run out of cards in your deck. Not banishing too many cards is usually an issue that's as easy to resolve as don't play the second desires, but here you've got to actively keep an eye on your deck size to maximize snake value. Two, there's another banishing-related skill test you have to manage, extravagance. Previously, when summoning Eater of Millions, you just threw your entire extra deck away. But now you've got to weigh that against the possibility that you'll end up with an extravagance over the next few turns. It's a painful nombo, but definitely not painful enough to cut either one. And three, it's expensive. I know that doesn't matter too much. I'm sure if you've made the decision to play Gren Maju, your brain is already so rotted that you've lost all concept of the value of money. All in all... I recommend it. I mean, this deck is indescribably fun, and no longer suffers from the pitfalls that have plagued it in the past. It might not be tier 1, but idiots like me have gotta play something. So that's that. It's not often that I find a deck that's as fun to play as it is to write about, but this is it. If you want to see me play the decks I make on this show on stream, I'm on twitch.tv slash mbtygo every Monday from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you have a certain idea for a deck or archetype you want to see me play on a future episode of this show, let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.